Welcome to In Unitatum Fide. This is a program where we keep raising a very dangerous but extremely important question, and that is what would the church look like if it were reunited today? Thank you so much for joining us. Today we are thrilled to be speaking with Dr. Stephen Backhouse. Dr. Backhouse is the founding director of Tent Theology, a venture that designs and delivers theology programs to local churches. He is the author of several books, including the piece that we're going to be discussing today, Zondervan's Essential Companion to Christian History. Dr. Backhouse, we're really honored that you'd be speaking with us today. Uh, it's nice to be here, Jonathan. Thank you for inviting me. And Dr. Backhouse, before I hit the recording buttons, we were just bantering about a past life of both of ours that we, yeah. we were both at Wycliffe Hall. I think we probably have lots of mutual friends and colleagues. So uh, we, I lived in Oxford. I did my DPhil in Oxford and I lived there for... Well, we had a house there. I mean, I lived there for 10, 10 years altogether. So, How cool. And so you have a PhD in theology from Oxford. Just tell yeah. me a moment what it is that you were studying during those years. That was in Kierkegaard. So I did my doctorate on uh, Søren Kierkegaard's attack upon Christendom and his uh, critique of Christian nationalism. Cool. So, uh, yeah, when I was doing that back in the day, everybody said, oh, Christian nationalism, that's not very relevant today, is it? And now look at us. Look where we are now. Wow, uh, it's the most important uh, phenomenon going all around the world at the moment. So, <laughs> wow. So I, yeah. I can tell we need to schedule another interview immediately. <laughs> I think we do. Nationalism. I Amazing. think we do. Yeah, Amazing. that was my work. So I was uh, I, I did uh, a critique of nationalism from a Christian point of view. Actually, a, of patriotism, just good old fashioned Christian patriotism, considering it uh, from a Christian point of view, if it's a valid Christian affection, and then. Um, uh, and then I became a political theologian, sort of as a result. I sort of backed into political theology through my Kierkegaard studies. Well, amazing. So that's what I've been doing. Yeah, I've been a political theologian now since since getting my P, my PhD. We absolutely do need to to chase that trail down too. I like it. <laughs> but it's all related to history as well. I mean, the history of the church is also the history of the rise and fall of nations and empires. So they are related. <laughs> wow, what an important time to be to be working in that area. Yeah. Um, Dr. Backhouse, you have founded Tent Theology, which I yeah. find really, really cool. A lot of the stuff that you're doing, I look up to in the work that we're doing at Aqueduct Project. Please tell me about your vision for Tent Theology. Well, so what happened was, um, I mean, you know, because you worked in a vicar factory as well. So in, in England, the Anglican Church, the Church of England, they, they call their pastors vicars. And uh, I also worked for a, a college that primarily trained people for ministry in the Church of England. And we jokingly called it a vicar factory and I was I liked theology I liked and I liked my students but I was also increasingly uncomfortable with theology just being a subject that people who want a Christian job do uh it, it had become just this sort of check that that people check in order to get the Christian job at the end of it so youth pastors or vicars or worship leaders that are told to go study theology so they could get their job and I didn't like that very much because that's not what theology is, actually. And uh, a lot of theologians will know this. You, you will know this as well, that uh, we often spend lots of time sitting around boardrooms going, how can we bring more people? How can we open up theology to a wider set of people than just professional Christians? And being academics, our solution is almost always to just put on another course. And all that really does is that just sort of establishes the idea that the university or the seminary is the only place one can do theology. So I got a bit tired of all that. And I thought, well, what if I went freelance and I took the theology course to the church rather than expect churches to send people to me? So what tent theology is, is it's intentionally a, a way to be, you can, it's easy to set up, easy to take down, easy to take anywhere. We open up spaces for like high level uh, engagement with the Bible or with theology, but inside local churches, inside worshiping communities. Um, and, we, and the idea is you don't have to leave church to learn about your own Christianity. So we start to do the work that, that in the university, but we do it with worshiping communities and there's no essays and there's no accreditation and there's, you're not expected to get a degree. You're just expected to, we're going to help us think Christianly about our own Christianity. That is really awesome. And I'm wondering, so where's the natural end goal for this new way of doing theology, this new mode of theology? Are you planning maybe in the future or are you already doing things entirely virtual or do you see a necessary component of what you're doing as being? On wow. I mean, lockdown. So 
I've been doing tent theology for four or five years now. And, uh, but obviously in the last couple of, or year and a half, the, the, the lockdown COVID stuff has meant that a lot of my work has just naturally become online, but that's all right because the churches are also having to do stuff online and they're, they, they're getting, everybody's getting used to meeting on zoom and things. So in a, some ways I'm just continuing the same work I always did, which is creating spaces to have discussions, uh, which are kind of not ideologically or apologetics. Like we're not trying to prove a point. We're not trying to give clever answers to complicated questions. We are just trying to find ways to really help people think through some of the stuff that, that theologians are used to thinking about, but which perhaps um, normal Christians don't often get that. And so one of the things I've been doing is the online stuff has been really fun. And I was also, I started doing a lot of podcasting. So I've been, creating uh recording a lot of my material and just putting it out there and that's been good too but one my next stage i guess the tent theology 2.0 is to open it up to more people so i i don't want to i'm not trying to build an empire i'm not trying to make it all about me i'd like to create something where it's almost like a directory and it's easy for churches to find theologians and for theologians to find churches uh, i would love to see like in the future that any worshiping community could have access to a theologian and it would be as easy they would they would think it's as odd not to have a theologian on the books as they would to not have a youth pastor or a music director i would like theologians to to start to think of one of the tools in their toolbox could be that they are also uh, available to local churches to help and to just be there that is so that's really, my next step. <laughs> that's a really awesome vision. Do you think you could build some sort of app so like I can select, here's the doctrinal statement that I want the theology. The theology yeah, I thought of like a dating app, a dating app for theologians and you swipe left and swipe right. And because I wanted to build, because theology is so complex and also some people can be very defensive about some of these positions. And I don't want to be in the position of being like a policeman, an ideological policeman. I. I, I want to just make it easy for people of goodwill to find other people of goodwill and they can sort out whether they want to be in the same room with each other. Right. I, I don't want people to say, oh, oh, only go to 10th theology if you want certain types of theology. I want them to maybe say, go to 10th theology if you want certain types of people. And that the, the, the people and the attitude towards these questions is more important, I think, than quite often even the answers that we give. So, yeah. But I, I want to stay away from being the thought police and I want to see if I can make it easy for the, for groups to figure it out themselves. <laughs> oh, cool. Well, I'm super excited for what you're doing and really grateful to be able to follow your work. And you've put together this really beautiful book. This is, um, I can't emphasize enough how picturesque and inspiring yeah. the book is. And I, I'm betting there's a maybe a series of backstories. So this is this is a pretty unique book. I've seen maybe one or the other, the Erdman's, the classic piece, the Erdman's Handbook of Church yeah. History. Also a really visually oriented uh, walk through church history, but this is a really beautiful job. What were you, uh, and I'm guessing that some of the, your work in the tent theology is of that variety too. I'm guessing it's visually rich and, and inspiring. It's an inspiring portrait of, of the material they present. What was the, what, was, what were you trying to do with this beautiful book? Well, well, first of all, I'm glad you you think it's beautiful. I'm really glad. I I was very keen. So what happened was the, the backstory was that I I'd um, as I said before, I'd, I'd done my doctorate on nationalism and patriotism and the rise and fall of nations and Christians' allegiance to the state and all that. And I wanted to turn it into a popular, a more accessible form. So I went to the publisher and I pitched this to them, my idea of a popular book on patriotism. And they they said, well. We don't really want your book that you've pitched, but what we do want is somebody who could write a, a history book. And I, and so I kind of, cause they'd been thinking about this in the background. So I went away and I thought about that for a while and I kind of thought I could probably do this instead. So it's not about patriotism or nationalism, but it is about world history. And it is about the, that there's a running theme through the history of Christianity, which is always of institutions building themselves up and then power being co-opted or them being uh, like a group might start full of fizz and energy and then it will become institutionalized and it will become maybe it started as the scrappy little outsiders with the Holy Spirit and then it becomes the establishment and it's in charge of educating and healing and making war and it becomes the, the culture that it used to be the scrappy little outsider to. And that's a story that you just see 
over and over and over again in Christian history. So I did realize to tell the story of the different Christianities in the world is also to tell the story of the rise of different civilizations and cultures and the fall of them as well. And what happens when, when the followers of Jesus clash with their own Christian cultures. That's also a, a story I find very interesting. So I thought I could probably write their history of Christianity that they wanted to write. And I went away and did it. And that's it. <laughs> but with the pictures and things is part of the, I mean, because just a book is so boring. Just words can be very dull. And, and part of the history of Christianity is its visual flavor, its architecture, its, its ethnic diversity. Um, and we very deliberately, one of the briefs was we don't want to just tell the story of like, um, you know, big C Christianity, <laughs> Calvinism, capitalism, <laughs> conservatism. We don't want to tell the story of just how one type of Protestant Christianity became dominant. We want to tell the story of, as of all Christianities. And in my book, like, I think pretty much every country in the world gets at least one mention. And so we wanted to say, make sure that it's a world story and not just a English story and an American story. Yeah. That is the perennial temptation of history, isn't it? To tell yeah. the whole story so it arrives at, guess who? Me. Yeah, <laughs> on the top of the pile. Exactly. Driving the story to your own experience and, and awareness of the world. But you really do broaden that perspective. That's well, I'm a Kierkegaardian and Kierkegaard made fun of that idea of history. This is that the Kierkegaard was very interested in history and church Christian history. And, and he also made fun of the idea that all these different European nations, they always have this view that history is just inevitably leading to one, wh whoever is top of the pile, that must be God's highest revelation at that time. And mm -hmm. he just makes fun of that. He says, Isn't that funny? All these European nations, they all think that they are God's <laughs> latest revelation to the world. <laughs> wow. Maybe it, maybe it's a perennial temptation of not just church history, but biblical studies too. You see lots of biblical mm. studies sort of our really an inferior reflection of, of the author, et cetera. So interesting. Yeah. yeah. Good, good work. One of the really interesting things about this book is you divide it into 20 chapters, one chapter for each century of church history. Yeah. And uh, that is not an easy format. It's a rollicking ride through church history. <laughs> wow. Because sometimes you're going to have massively too much material. Sometimes you're going to have much less material. So, well, yeah. What are your challenges in maintaining that one chapter, one century per chapter scheme through the book? I, I really, I'm like, how do we figure this out? I wanted to make it as simple as possible, as possible. And I thought, how do we work this out? And I thought, well, there are 20 centuries and there's, we could make it 20 chapters. So what I did was I, I spent the first month of research. I actually just made a huge timeline. I went into lots of different books. Uh, history books and I compiled a timeline that just went on for pages and pages and pages and I ended up I did basically just said okay well what happens if we just only write about something that happened between the year 100 and the year 200 or 400 and 500 because uh, I had to start somewhere I just had to I had to organize my thoughts somehow and I thought what if I just did that and that's where we went really and then I I, I worked through my timeline after I'd broken it down into 20 sections and I tried to stick with it that way <laughs> and then there's lots of editing like this is no if you have a favorite theologian or biblical scholar or christian hero of the faith that person will probably get mentioned once maybe twice and then we'll be moving on it's not you're not dwelling with anybody for for all the time they deserve you're kind of mentioning them within the wider scheme of what else is going on around the world it's fast-paced it's quick yeah. moving. And I'm guessing the eighth century, the problem that you probably encountered in the eighth century was how to how to find the material in the first place. And up in the 20th century, that's going to be a giant problem because you can only name a few people. Yeah. yeah. 500 yeah. that you'd like the to. Early, earlier chapters can dwell more on the people and their stories. And then the later chapters become just a, a name drop and then moving swiftly on. <laughs> yeah, wow. that is true. Great. Um, I'm really interested in one of the things that we do in, Unit in Unitatum Fide is we explore the question of um, the unity of the church, despite the yeah. huge diversity that we have in the church. I was really interested to see that you included in your text uh, the first, what you call the first schism of the church. And the little known schism is between Pope Felix III, who's Bishop of Rome at the time, and then Acacius of Constantinople. The debate, this is between, apparently the schism 
is lasting between 482 and 518 AD. And yeah. the hot question is monophysitism. That is the mm -hmm. question of, uh, does Christ have one or multiple natures? We know mm -hmm. from Chalcedon, proclaimed in 451, that Christ is both fully divine and fully human. So the question on the table is, does Christ have more than one nature if he's both God and man? And this question, which we don't think about too much today, split the church from 482 to 518. Yeah. Um, why did you include this in your survey of church history? Well, do you know, I mean, we give it names like monophysitism, and we do talk about it as if it's talking about the nature of Christ. And that is on the surface. That is a big part of it. But Again, I'll go back to my original interest. A lot of these schisms is actually just because there's a whole tranche of Christian speaking Greek and there's a whole nother tranche of Christian speaking Latin. And the cultures are drifting apart. And the, the, a lot of these so-called theological debates sometimes are coming down to just linguistic emphasis and differences. And there's a cultural element as well. And there's a national element. And there is a real schism. I'm not saying there wasn't one, but we have to think it's just a bunch of eggheads sitting around trying to um, hating each other because they slightly got the definition of the Trinity wrong. There's whole like nationalisms at stake as well. And the Byzantine culture is jostling for power and position and they're losing prestige to the Latin West. And, and these things are happening and there's economics and there's language and there's ethnicities and there's politics happening as well as the natures of christ and how we talk about the trinity and i wanted to just sort of say look these schisms have been they're brewing really it's it's like a it's like a long story how we get to the different main branches of christian tradition it's it's a long story it isn't like there's this uh, everybody was happily speaking with one voice and then boom all of a sudden they had a disagreement and now we have three different main churches they literally weren't speaking with the same voice, which is why they grew so distant and so apart. So what you know from your study of church history is that these divides, we remember them as theological controversies, yeah. but how come these divides always take place across linguistic and cultural divides? That's too coincidental not to take note of. Yeah, so right. How do you separate those things out in your mind? You know, can can we say like the divide here over monophysitism was like 50% cultural and 50% linguistic? Or how do you divide? How do you say what the priority between culture and theology was in these ancient divides? Well, I, I can't. I can't say that. I can't add a number to it or anything. But I, I think what we can do is let ourselves notice that the story that one the story that a group tells itself about itself will always be false. Like it will always, maybe not on purpose. I'm not saying they did it on purpose, but it will always be some sort of lie because it will never be able to encompass what's really going on. And there'll always be blind spots that they don't notice. And there'll always be areas that they don't want to admit to themselves. And so, you know, the stories that the church historians are telling to themselves about themselves are that they weight quite heavily the theological stuff. And they're kind of not noticing the other things happening. And it sometimes takes other people from a few centuries distant to notice what's that. Maybe there's more than just theology happening here. Or the theology itself is not hermetically sealed from the other stuff, right? Like, if you notice that the earliest Christians, the New Testament Christians, now I'm into your area, Jonathan, so I'm very hesitant here to talk about the Bible. But you know, one of the engines driving the, the New Testament imagination was specifically to break down barriers between Jew and Gentile and to hammer away at a, some idea of ethnic privilege or historical uh, right and to say, uh, we are a new people, a royal priesthood, and we, we, we aren't going to try and define ourselves just by one type of ethnic stronghold or privilege. And you start to see that like that was one of the main things the earliest Christians ever had to deal with. And that never went away. And so you start to notice the same kind of themes uh, keep coming up again and again. And, and people are trying to cross these barriers or they're trying to resist the temptation. I think of, I do feel of patriotism as like a, a temptation to be resisted rather than a virtue to be embraced. That there's a, always a temptation that Christians will want to give prior allegiance to their home team that they were born into. And they start to see themselves and their fellow, the people who look like them and sound like them as much as possible. They see, they give them priority. 
Whereas the New Testament is like, no, we got to give priority to people who are following the people who are following the way of Jesus. They're the brothers and sisters. It's not the people who look like you and sound like you. And, and I feel like some of the history of church uh, development is often the, the, the development of that theme either being ignored or attacked by Christians. And so often what you find is some of the, wherever you find a revival, moments of revival or reformation, it will often become accompanied with some pretty strong political overtones that often do have to do with things like crossing barriers, um, nonviolence against enemies is a, is a big one that happens in a lot of revivals. And then what will happen is as those revivals become concretized, they'll start to cool and they'll start to become the, uh, the patriotic nationalist blocks that they originally start were undermining. Right. And it, it all starts over again. And I think these, the history of some of these schisms is part of that. And you see this rapprochement, you see people trying to, to talk to each other. You see them sending emissaries to each other. Mm -hmm. And you can see like there's a minority voice seeking peace, but it doesn't really, it succumbs to the majority voice, which sort of retreats back into these blocks of linguistic and nationalist blocks. Sadly. Yeah. I think the history of Christianity is not a happy thing to look at. If you love Jesus, the history of the church is not, is not always a fun read. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> Right. So you're you're leading us in a in a great path here. You're revealing to us the complexity of all history, but in this case, Christian history is also just as complex as any other national or yeah. social or political history. It's messy. It's really yeah. messy. And yeah. from the safe distance of 1,500 years, we can look back and say this early monophysite controversy was tied up in all of these cultural linguistic divides as well. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to make history less messy or or are we is as the job of the historian who cares about theology and believes that there is mm -hmm. value in explaining theology from the self, the biblical and theological self-understanding of the groups involved mm -hmm. telling that story in theological terms and then simply noting there are all of these cultural questions hanging around this controversy as well is that is is there a way to make it less messy what's your preferred way <laughs> <laughs> well uh the the again the the temptation or the drive to tell a very simple story is very appealing but it's wrong like it's just false it isn't a simple story and so if somebody tells you a simple story of christian history they are lying to you and mm. uh, they're telling you a lie that's really attractive and that makes you feel good and a, a typical simple story would be the 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 story of the heroes of the faith kind of story like i've taught people about Martin Luther and the Reformation. And uh, you teach Protestants about Martin Luther and the Reformation, and they, they're, they're set up to think of him as a real hero of the faith. And he did some things that were really heroic. But when I teach, I also give all the quotes he had about how much he hated Jews and how he led, preached a sermon which led to a riot against Jews and burning them and uh, burning them out of their synagogues and things. And so you're like, you have to have both. And I'm not saying martin luther is only an anti-semite and nothing else but you can't also you can't say he was only a heroic defender of the faith and nothing else either you have to say this is our story it's more than one thing and uh, so i'm trying i am trying to resist simplicity or the hero the great hero kind of stories actually and i think we see it again our kind of more kierkegaardian to see history as more like a, a repeating cycle rather than an, a linear linear development hmm. so conservatives tend to see they have a, a golden age version of history and they're like it was better back then and now look we're so bad now right mm -hmm. and liberal progressives tend to have a positive view and they say it was bad then but look how good we are now mm -hmm. whereas kierkegaard says well you're both just thinking in terms of linear progression or regression what if we started to notice that actually the human condition doesn't change very much and what we end up seeing is actually the same kinds of things over and over again, which is people being proud, setting themselves up, and then along comes a minority voice which says, you have forgotten the cause of the oppressed. You've forgotten the foreigner amongst you. You've forgotten the widow. The Lord wants, requires mercy, not sacrifice. And then, and you're always seeing every generation, if essentially the Christianity is renewing itself every generation. 
And that's what a lot of these, these rise and falls are. They're just every generation discovering Jesus for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to sort of point that out. So it's simple, it, not simple as in a simplistic story, but more to say, here's some tools to look out for when you read Christian history. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I really appreciate your restraint. I admire your restraint. That's not easy to do. And I think you're using the right categories there of resisting temptation in reducing the story that's something untrue because of its simplicity. Yeah. So I, I respect that. One of the ways that you show restraint in this volume is yeah. reducing your comments to Soren Kierkegaard to a couple of paragraphs. I know, they sure... only gave me 200 words. <laughs> I gave myself 200 words. I'm sure that was very painful uh, uh, to do. I was yeah. intrigued. Knowing that you're a specialist in Kierkegaard, looking over that section especially, you say that Kierkegaard attempts to, quote, reintroduce Christianity to Christendom. Would yeah. you be willing to expand for us on what Kierkegaard's project was, please? So Kierkegaard was a Danish philosopher. He, was, he, he, he died in the 1850s. He never really left Denmark. But, um, but he was very aware of the of the phenomenon of Christendom, which wasn't just a state church. It wasn't just the, uh, like a lot of Americans today will think, oh, we don't have Christendom because we don't have an official state church. But Kierkegaard wasn't talking about that. He was talking about any culture in which Christianity is in its building blocks. Any, any culture in which Christianity is the sort of backdrop to the society, that's Christendom. And one of his things was the idea of, he said, look, when the apostle Paul stood up in the marketplace and said the name of Jesus Christ, people had never heard that word before. And it was intriguing to them. Today, if I go and say the name Jesus Christ in a marketplace, right? People will think I stubbed my toe, right? Like the name of Jesus, everybody in Christendom has heard the name of Jesus. That doesn't mean there is nobody in America today that has not heard the name of Jesus. It doesn't mean they all know anything about him or are following his way or anything like that, but they've all heard the name. And Kierkegaard said, that is Christendom. It's not a legal uh, relationship between church and state. It's a cultural uh, awareness that the things of Christianity have pervaded our social imagination to such an extent that it, they, they form the language we use, the they shape the geography of our cities. The churches are on the corner. Yeah. Where's the nearest bank? Well, go down and then at first Lutheran church, take a left. Or go down St. Paul Street and you'll find the bank, right? Like the saints and the churches form our geography as well. And so Kierkegaard says, in that world in which being a Christian is as easy as being born, you're born into Christendom. You're a Christian because you're just a citizen of your country. And he said, in that world, being a Christian is as easy as being born. I need to make it harder. <laughs> I need to reawaken maybe what it felt like when the Apostle Paul said the name Jesus Christ in a marketplace again. And so for him, he said, we need to reintroduce Christianity back into Christendom. Like Christendom has done away with it. This idea that America is a Christian nation or that the British Empire was a Christian empire or these ideas have actually, all they've done is they've, substituted your nationality for your following the way of Jesus. And the nationality is more popular and it tugs on the heartstrings more and it, it offers more um, safety in life. And so people go with that one more than they go with the way of Jesus again and again and again. And so he's saying, look, that, that Christendom model of Christianity has actually just made people following Jesus, it, it means they don't do it anymore. And then you have a whole lot of people who think they're Christian. And for him, it was because they're white and they speak Danish, you right? And he said, this isn't, that's not Christian. That's just being Danish. I need to make it harder. So Dr. Backhouse, I'm hearing a lot of resonance between the core themes of Kierkegaard and your own uh, ministry, which I, I'm hearing a prophetic edge to what you, the way that you're teaching theology. So I've yeah. got to ask, did you come to Kierkegaard because you perceived in him the theological resources to do what was needed for today's moment? Or did you develop from your study and a pre-existing love of Kierkegaard this set of tools that you now use in tent theology? Well, I, I grew up, um, so I grew up in evangelical. I grew up born again. 
in a conservative uh, among self-described fundamentalists. I grew up in Canada, Western Canada, and um, and and I grew up very much associating Christianity with being a culture warrior. You know, you must defend. Here's the talking points that when you go to the secular university and they talk about abortion or evolution or the rapture, here's the things you have to say. And it was very much that idea that I was being brought up to be a defender of a certain civilization or culture against the secular liberals or whatever it is. And I moved to England when I was 19, just as an adventure. And I ended up going to a little church, a little Anglican church in a, in a not very exciting part of a not very exciting part of the country. And I was in this church of people who all believed they all loved Jesus, but they didn't all agree about climate change or the rapture or even abortion. And yet they were all in one room together and they were all singing the same hymns together. And it was so different from the culture I'd grown up in, which was so mono monocultural when it came to politics and social economic vision, right? That it really kind of rocked me a little bit. And I thought I need to think about this difference between being a follower of Jesus and just being a good citizen of my particular culture. And I just, I was working in a bookshop at that time and I discovered Kierkegaard in my book, in the bookshop. And I was using my employee discount to buy fear and trembling and in fear and trembling, which was a book he wrote describing Denmark forties, talking about Christendom. He was describing the culture I was aware of in you know, 1990s evangelicalism. And I thought, wow, this guy gets it. He understands the difference between, he started to give me language to talk about the difference between being a follower of Jesus and being a Christian or a Christendom citizen. And so that's what led me to study him again and again and again. <laughs> that is an amazing story. And, and as a church historian, one of, the, one of the stories that we can see how church history can be life-giving how the, the things that you're teaching yeah. in theology can change a person's life. You can start out on spiritual on, on a spiritual adventure, but that turns into a lifelong spiritual pilgrimage. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Beckhouse, I need to ask you also a question about theological education. Um, yeah. As a industry or sector of society, as a, as a way of life, theological education is changing hugely. It's not just theological education that's changing, it's education right. in general that's changing. But um, what, what is it that you see? What are some of the new opportunities, but also some of the new challenges specific to theological education as it's operating today in this post-COVID world? I, I'm always wary of professionalization in churches. I'm, I'm wary of like being a professional is really good for lots of things. So if you want to be an accountant, you should go and learn how to be an accountant. Um, if you want to be a plumber, you should learn how to be a plumber. If you, if you want to be a, an academic historian, you should go and learn how to be an academic historian. The problem with theology is that it isn't a professional qualification. It's meant to be a form of worship. Augustine thought that theology was a form of worship because you are saying God's goodness back to God as best as you know how. And you can't really do worship as an objective academic subject something bad happens to it when it becomes that right and so i i really think christians should think seriously about their christianity like i'm not i don't want to dumb dumb it down i'm not trying to be dumb but i don't think we should treat theology like we would treat an accountant or a plumber or a historian i i think something bad happens to our worship when we assess it based solely on essays or the ability to to read a certain amount of text in a short amount of time. And I, so I want, I want churches to start to think of, if they don't like the word theology, maybe just say thinking Christianly or thinking seriously about the ways of Christ and, and drawing from, we have a long history. We have 2000 years or more of people thinking really well about this stuff, like drawing from it. I'm not saying make it all up as you go along, connect yourself in that wider conversation, but maybe find ways for it to be a conversation that everybody can be a part of and not just the people who think they're called to Christian ministry, right? Like they need theology as well as everybody else. So I'd love to find a way to maybe separate the professionalization of Christianity from the learning of theology if possible. Yeah. 
that's one of my things. And it's a really cool vision. Dr. Backhouse, uh, this program, Inunitatum Fide, we're exploring with theologians around the world today what church unity would look like. And mm. I, I think this is going to be a really important conversation all over the church in so many different areas. We're all talking to each other. We're, we're Zooming with each other. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that's happening in the post-COVID world is we're not going back to a to a pre-COVID world where, you know, we all sent letters to one another and like St. Augustine did. This mm-hmm. is something different. And we can have these real-time conversations hypothetically with anybody. Um, presumably, one of the things that we need to talk about as a, as a Christian church broadly is how it is we relate to one another within our current denominational structures. They, they were made for yeah. the time. Uh, what yeah. is it that a reunited church would look like today if, if, if we continue to work for Jesus, what Jesus is praying for, and we pray with Jesus toward a John 17 unity, mm-hmm. what does that look like for you? Well, I do get a lot of emails and things from people. And I'm not trying to get all super political here on you, but like the last four years have been really rough. <laughs> uh, the, 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 uh, the high uh, association of, of, especially in America of Christianity with a certain form of like patriotic, make America great again, jingoism, uh, kind of an angry patriotism has created a lot of people who are coming to me and they're losing their faith and they're not losing their faith because of secular liberals. They're losing their faith because they're like, the, the things that the loudest voices in my Christian world are shouting for don't look like anything Jesus would have said or did. And, there's, and, and, I, and they, they say, I think I'm losing my faith. And I say, well, do you like Jesus? And they're like, yeah, I love Jesus. And I'm like, do you like his way? Do you like how he treats his enemies? Do you like what he, how he thinks you should be open-handed about money or fame or power? Yeah, I love that. I find it really attractive. And so I say, well, I don't think you have a crisis of faith. I think you just have a crisis of the denomination you were born into. (laughs) You're just having a crisis of culture, but you still really love the way of Jesus. And I think there's something like that, that I'm finding that people are caring less and less about their denominations or their tribes. They're not, I'm finding people don't care that much about being Catholic or Calvinist or Pentecostal. They just care about the way of Jesus. And they're starting to notice that not every Christian likes the way of jesus right that the way of how he dealt with things how he dealt with his power or how he showed his anger or how he treated foreigners those things are different to what a lot of christians would do and i think that unity is gonna i don't know if unity is ever possible in that grand everyone speaking with one voice kind of way but i feel like the dividing lines are going to be less about what at what stage of life you get baptized or when you how often a month you have the communion or whether you speak in tongues or not i feel like i'm noticing a real dividing line between are you do you like the way of jesus or not is your christianity one that's trying to follow the way of jesus or is it one that's trying to defend a certain type of christian culture and i feel like that's where unity is people are finding their fellow travelers based on that I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but that's what I'm noticing in my work. Uh, I repeat, you have a prophetic edge to the work you're doing, which is really important. Um, So let me ask another question in that regard. So you've identified, I think correctly, that a lot of American churches are really at a a crisis point. Do the churches exist to maintain their own structures and their own institutional form, or do Mm. they exist to point people to Christ? And yeah, I've, I'm always so attracted when I find a church that's willing to dismantle its own structures if they think it's no longer serving that purpose. And like I said before, they hold their their stuff with an open hand. They don't clutch tightly to what is rightfully theirs, even if it's rightfully theirs, but they don't clutch tightly to it and they let it go if it's going to help. And to the Jew, I'm a Jew. To the Greek, I'm a Greek, right? And and I, I find there's something uh, really attractive about that when we, we maybe as white Christians with lots of money or whatever, we've inherited positions that we basically did nothing to earn. What do we do with that now? What do we do with that power and privilege that we've, we're sitting at the top of the heap right now, right? We won the lottery ticket of life. So now what do we do with it? And I always like when I find groups that are willing to 
to be creative with what they do with what they've inherited. And they don't think their job is just to preserve it no matter what. <laughs> so this is really important. And the, the vision that comes to my mind is what would Jesus do if he were on your elder board, right? Yeah. <laughs> what would right? Jesus do if he was one of your voting leaders? So what then becomes your message to the church? The, the American church is certainly caught in that struggle right now institutional structures or the ethics of jesus certainly well, obviously it's not just america obviously it's not just american but <laughs> that's good of you but I, I plead guilty so how what do you what is your message to churches that are in that dilemma and um how do how do the churches shepherd people properly to christ what are some practical things we can do to make sure that there's as little damage as possible at this point forward um do you know, Jesus is, his words are not hard to understand, but they are hard to do. And you often find like the Sermon on the Mount gets, gets ignored in churches or, func or privatized, radically privatized or explained away. And I feel like I would like churches to start to think of themselves as an alternative political group. Uh, there's a theologian named Stanley Hauvas, who's a very interesting theologian, Texan theologian, and he and, and he says, look, the church's response is not to withdraw from the world and it's not to just become like the world. It's to be an alternative to the world. And one of the things that it can do is it can follow the way of Jesus, for example, as in the Sermon on the Mount, but not in some isolated individualistic way. It's not just you, Jonathan, all by yourself up against the world, trying to love your enemies and turn the other cheek. It's we are trying to do it we are loving our enemies we are turning the other cheek and if you are faced with a problem we've got your back and to have churches to think of themselves more as um networks of benign resistance to babylon right that and realize we are living in babylon right now we're living in these empires that have grown arrogant and and lost their way and they've forgotten the cause of the oppressed and this the foreigner in their midst and so we get that's us we get to do that now um and i don't think christianity is primarily ab about you and your salvation of your individual soul i think it's about us being part of the kingdom of god which jesus said is here you know there's a there is an element of the kingdom of god that is present and he said he essentially said the kingdom of god is present um when you listen to my voice the kingdom of god is with you when you do as i do the kingdom of God is with us. And uh, I, I want us to start to awaken some of that and to help each other do that. Wow. We have learned so much from you today, Dr. Backhouse. I'm super grateful to speak with Dr. Stephen Backhouse, author of the text, Essential Companion to Christian History from Zondervan, available from 2019. We're so grateful and uh, looking forward already to your next book. 